Welcome to this debrief session reviewing one of the questions from the March 2020 exam. My name is Aileen Edgar and I'm the Head Tutor for Advanced Taxation at LearnSignal. I'm going to walk you through question four from the March 2020 exam in terms of approach and how to answer it, the marking scheme and also the key points that the examiner wanted to make about this question and the answers that were given in the exam itself. I highly recommend that you spend some time reviewing the examiner's report for previous diets of the exam that you'll be sitting as they contain invaluable advice on how to prepare for your exam, how to understand what's being asked in a question and technical areas that students are tending to struggle with. All of this will help you prepare for your sitting of the exam. So the question we're going to be looking at in this session is a 20 mark question and you are given some introductory information on the question first of all. We're told that we've got an individual called Pedro and he has asked us for advice on three issues. Firstly we're asked to give advice on the reason that Pedro has had to pay some inheritance tax in connection with the de death of his aunt Marina. Secondly we're asked to explain why the letting of this cottage it qualifies as a furnished holiday letting. And thirdly, we're asked to give some advice on a contribution into a personal pension scheme. So if we look at the actual keywords here, we have got some advice that we've been asked to give. We have to give an explanation about the furnished holiday letting. And we're also asked about the implications of the personal pension scheme. So these are the three kind of key areas that we're looking at. And therefore, just by reading this, this brief scenario information to begin with, we actually already now start to pick up a good idea of all the things that we're going to be asked to do. What areas are we tackling in this question. We've got some inheritance tax. We have got property income because we've got a furnished holiday let. And we've also got pension information to deal with. So we've got three things. And you can see that I'm just using the highlight function here on the CBE tools to pick out the keywords for myself and I already even before I've read the detailed scenario information over here I already have an understanding of how this question might be broken down. So broadly then we've got a 20 mark question it's going to look at an individual who wants some inheritance tax, rental income and pension advice. The next thing to do in the exam is to open up the requirements exhibit and do this before reading the further information in the scenario. This is what I always recommend, is that you would click on the requirements first of all. You'll see it opens up another box and all your requirements are in here. And what I would do then is to copy those requirements and paste them into where I'm going to put my answer. So I'm going to put my answer in the word processor option. So I'm going to click on word processor response option. And I'm going to, one of the little quirks about this is you need to actually click on the paste button to get it to paste in. Now you'll see that the formatting goes off a little bit, but it doesn't take much to fix it. And remember, of course, before you submit your exam, before you finish your exam, you would be wanting to delete all of this information anyway. The reason that I put this information in here is really to cover two um, things. One, I can now close down this requirements tab and I never have to open that again. And secondly, I find that if students have the requirements there in front of them as they're writing the answer, it's much easier for them to check back all the time to see if they're actually doing what they're being asked to do. And that's one of the key reasons why students struggle to get good 
mark sometimes is because they're not actually answering the specific question that's been asked. And I think having the requirement there as you type in your answer helps you check it several times. Now by reading the requirements of the question before you read through all the detailed scenario information, you should avoid wasting some valuable time and you'll do a more effective read through as well because you'll be focused on which parts of the scenario relate to which requirement and also you're going to have a better idea of the key focus of the question, meaning you're less likely to go off on a tangent and not answer that specific question being asked. Indeed, the examiner for this March 2020 exam mentioned in their examiner's report that as an issue that students weren't answering the specific requirement. The examiner also pointed out that the wording of the requirements are really carefully chosen to give students as much guidance as possible in regard to the style and content of the answer that they're expecting you to produce. The exam's report reminds students that marks can only be given for answers that actually satisfy the requirements and not for any other information that is provided by the candidate, even if what you're seeing is technically correct. If it doesn't address the specific requirement you've been asked, then there's no marks available for it. So in this question, then we have three requirements, two that are worth five marks and the third one being worth 10 marks. So 20 marks in total means you should be spending about 35 minutes or so on the question, about 10 minutes on part A, same on part B, and about 15, just a little bit more than 15 minutes perhaps on part C. It's really important that you do this time plan at the start of each question and make sure that you do stick to it. It's much better to leave a question unfinished and move on to answering the next one than not attempt a whole question at all because you've run out of time. We tend to score more of our marks in the early part of answering each question and we run out of steam towards the end and pick up less marks. So it's better for you to maximise your time and your productivity and those um, high scoring marks by making sure that you attempt every single question. And again, that examiner's report that I mentioned for March 2020 indicated that time management was one of the issues that students appeared to be having there with some of them spending a disproportionate amount of time on some requirements compared to others. So remember your time plan and stick to it in the exam. Let's look at the first requirement in more detail then. We're asked to explain the inheritance tax implications of the gift of the cottage. Both at the time that it was gifted and as a result of Marina's death. This is for five marks. Now in this scenario, we're given more detail on this. So now I would want to open up the scenario information and have a look at what's in there. And you can see there's a PDF in here and it's split out into various headings and you can scroll up and down here. You can also resize it if you want to at the bottom right hand corner. You can also zoom if you need to as well. And the information that we've got here that's relevant to this requirement is that uh, Pedro was given this cottage. It's located in the UK. He was given it 10 years before his aunt's death. She lived in the cottage for two months every year rent free during that time. And other than that, she stayed in her main residence. Pedro then inherited various unfurnished residential UK properties in Marina's will when she died. So we know we've got five marks for this requirement, so let's break down the information. We're asked to, if I close this scenario down, we're asked to give the inheritance tax implications of the gift of the cottage at the time of the gift in 2009 and also when Marina dies in 2019. So when Pedro was first given the holiday cottage from an inheritance tax point of view, this would be a potentially exempt transfer. So no tax would have been due. And what I'm going to show you is the scratch pad. 
and here you'll see that I've just put down some notes on this already. Now you don't get any formatting options um, here but I've got um, some of my notes and they're just kind of listed out. So at the time of the gift is a potentially exempt transfer, no tax to pay. So that's dealt with that part of the requirement. And then the other thing we were to talk about was when Marina dies. Now Marina died more than seven years after making the gift of the cottage, but inheritance tax would be payable as a result of her death since the gift was a gift with reservation. Um, because Marina continued to live in that property and she was getting benefit from the use of the holiday cottage following the gift right up until she died and she didn't pay a commercial rent for staying there. So here I jotted down some notes in the scratch pad on this. So I've got the fact that on Marina's death it was more than seven years after the gift so there's going to be no further tax on the pet. However, there is an issue in the fact that it's a gift with reservation and I've given the reason why that is. And therefore, the rules are that inheritance tax will be payable on the higher of the inheritance tax payable if the cottage was in the death estate and if it was taxed as a pet back in March 2009. And then I've just popped in my last point is just to make sure that we know who is actually responsible for paying this and it will be uh, Pedro. So what I can do then is I can copy that and I can open up my answer again and you'll see that even though I shut down my word processor I closed it what I've done already is still saved so it's, you don't need to worry about closing any of these windows down any work you've done will still be there and then I want to just uh, paste this again remembering that you need to actually click on the paste button and I'm going to put that answer in there. Now again you can see the formatting has gone a little bit off um, and you might need to then play about a little bit to fix that. There are some options here for how you want to lay it out with bullet points perhaps um, but there's not a huge amount of options there. You can make things bold though if you want things to stand out more or underline them. So just be aware of that, if you're using the scratch pad and you copy things then you're going to lose any formatting that you might have carefully crafted in the scratch pad. So you might want to just jot down your notes within the word processor um, window yourself um, that way. Um, it's really up to you and you need to spend some time practicing to see what's going to work for you best in the exam. And the other thing to be aware of with the scratch pad is that nothing in there is going to get marked. So you want to make sure that you're not typing your whole answer in there, then copying it into the word processor space. Uh, you might run out of time, your formatting will all go as well. Um, so bear that in mind as well. So I would copy in my answer then for part A in there. Now let me just explain the bit that I think students struggle with here, which is about the gift with reservation and how we deal with that from the tax point of view. So it's a gift with reservation because it was not lifted prior to our death, that reservation. Uh, so the inheritance tax is going to be payable on, as I said, the higher of the inheritance tax. Um, payable if it had been in her death estate, that cottage, or if it had been taxed as a pet back in March 2009. We already know that the latter of these options is zero as no tax would be payable on the pet as a result of Marina's death because her death was more than seven years after the gift. So that leaves us with the inheritance tax on the value of the cottage being included in Marina's death estate. Now as the value of her death estate is more than the nil rate band of 325,000 because remember back in the scenario if we just look at that again we're told here that he also received these unfurnished residential properties from her death estate. That was 670,000 value. So we know without any other information about her death estate, we know that um, the nil rate band would have been used up. So inheritance tax is going to be payable on her estate then. The inheritance tax that's going to be attributable to the cottage because it's a gift with reservation has to be paid 
by Pedro, who is the recipient of the gift. And there for five marks, albeit it's in a bullet point um, list, and I think you're better to obviously write in fuller sentences, but you can see that I've got at least five points there. So you want to think about the number of marks and think about at least a, a one good quality point per mark. So that's us covered enough to get our five marks for part A. Moving on to part B then. This is for five marks. And you can see I've got here explain by reference to the relevant conditions why the holiday cottage will qualify as a furnished holiday letting for the first 12 month period. So let's look back at our scenario for a little bit more information. And you can see there's a, a heading here, Pedro property income. That is specifically about the um, holiday cottage. And we're told that it has been rented, it's been available for rent on a commercial basis since July 2019. It'll have a 70% occupancy rate. No tenant will have stayed in the cottage for more than 14 consecutive days during the first year of letting and we're given rental income information as well. But that's not going to be what we're looking for for part B. That'll come in part C. We're just looking at these two parts here. That's what we're interested in. So if we close down the scenario and go back to where we were going to write up our answer, and again, I've put some notes down into the scratch pad on this. So we're asked to explain why that cottage qualifies as a furnished holiday letting. So it is a fairly straightforward application of the criteria to the specific conditions that were given in the question. We're told that it's located in the UK, is rented unfurnished and on a commercial basis. So now we know that, we then look and see whether it satisfies the other conditions. So what about availability? The cottage is available continuously for commercial letting from the 1st of July 2019 onwards. So it's going to meet that condition that it needs to be available for at least 210 days in the first 12 months. The actual letting condition? Well, the cottage will have a 70% occupancy rate throughout the period it's available for letting. So it's going to be let for at least 105 days then in that first 12 month period. And what about the pattern of occupation condition? Well, no tenant is going to stay in the cottage for more than 14 consecutive days during the first year for which it's available for letting. So there's no possibility of the number of days of longer term occupation. And by that, we mean more than 31 consecutive days exceeding 155 in that first 12 month period. And again, you could copy that. I've just done my notes in the scratch pad. You could have written that straight into the word processor area. I'm um, remembering that you don't get anything marked in that scratch pad and you lose your formatting when you copy things over. But again, it was five marks. And I think I've got quite a lot of the conditions there. I've related them specifically back to the scenario we're looking at. So there's definitely five marks worth there. Now let's look back at our last requirement, 10 marks now. We're asked to work out the reduction in Pedro's income tax liability for the tax year 1920 here as a result of making his planned contribution of £85,000 gross into his personal pension scheme. And we're told that our answer should include an explanation of the amount of personal allowance available to Pedro in this case. So I might, for example, want to put some of that in bold, perhaps because I think I'm going to concentrate so much on looking at the figures that I'll forget about that little bit of the requirement. You might want to just put in bold the action words, but there's a few different things you can do in here to again help you spot any bit that you've missed out in the question or where you maybe have read the requirements incorrectly um, and catch yourself before you go too far. There's quite a bit of information available to us that's going to be relevant to this then. We've got some 
rental income information, some employment information. We've got the information about pension scheme, that there's an occupational pension scheme contribution as well. So a lot to pick through. This require, question requires us to do an income tax computation and deal with both occupational and personal pension contributions. So it's going to really test your understanding of different types of uh, pensions and how tax relief is given. So we start this question then by doing an income tax computation, including this pension contribution that Pedro wants to make. We are looking to get a figure we can then compare to the £41,260 we're given in the uh, scenario. So what I've done is there's a couple of options for how you might want to do this. You can use the table function within the word processor. You could set this out and you could put in, you could start putting in employment income, for example, and then you can have property income and you could set out your answer that way within the word processing. Now, of course, then you don't have any help in adding up any of the figures, but you might prefer the layout of doing it this way if it's a relatively straightforward calculation, then you've got all your answer in one place. Or you can use a spreadsheet. Now, I've already pre-populated this just to save us a bit of time, but I'll go through um, each part of it for you. We've got Pedro's employment income, 75,000. That's his annual salary from the company he worked for. There's no taxable benefits to add to that. So we've got 75,000 there. His property income is going to be the 14,500 we were told was his net rental income from the cottage plus the 32,000 net rental income from the unfurnished residential properties that he inherited. As we're told these amounts are net, there's nothing else for us to do with those figures other than add them together and get the total property income figure of 46,500. Now I have, when I've been populating this, I have used this option here where you can use that to put in the commas for thousands and to two decimal places if that's something that you think would be useful. Um, and then you can also underline to um, show where your additions are, where your totals are. And that's what I've done here. Now we total those together. I've used the sum function there to get net income of £121,500. Now from that, we would deduct the personal allowance if any. With total income in excess of 100000 you might think there would be a reduction in the amount of personal allowance available. And therefore, why do we have a deduction here of 11850 but remember, when we are looking at the personal allowance and reducing it, we are comparing adjusted net income. Adjusted net income is affected by pension contributions. We can reduce the net income figure by the planned contribution of 85,000 then, because it's within Pedro's relevant earnings limit for the year. His employment income is 75,000 and the furnished holiday letting income, which counts, is 14,500. So that covers his 85,000 contribution. Therefore, we can deduct that to get his adjusted net income. That takes us below the 100,000 then, so there's no reduction in the personal allowance. Taxable income then comes out at £109,650. All of that is taxed at 20% because remember the other thing about this pension is the gross pension contribution is used to extend that basic rate band up to £119,500. We do need to consider whether there will be a pension contribution charged though because of the high amount that he's wanting to pay in. Pedro was eligible for the annual allowance from tax year 1819. So he's going to be able to bring 32000 forward from that year as 8000 of the 40000 limit will have been used up by the employer's contribution. The 32,000 then that's brought forward and the 40,000 for the current year, so that's the current year's allowance, um, they add to 72,000 of annual allowance that is available for him to use in this current year. The amount going into pensions in the current year would be the 85,000. 
that he wants to have in the personal pension scheme, plus the 8,000 from the employer. So 93,000 in total. So he's actually putting into the pension more than what his annual allowance amount is. So this gives us 21,000 then that's not covered by that annual allowance figure of 72,000. There's going to be a charge instead for that. And how we work it out um, is by taking um, what's left of the extended basic rate band. So there's 9,850 we've not used so far. That gets taxed at the basic rate of 20%, giving us that 1,970. And the remainder of the excess is taxed at 40%. So that gives us 4,460. We're going to add together the tax on the actual income and then the two amounts of tax charge there. And we get total tax of 28,360. We then compare that to the figure we were given in the question, which was 41,260. And by making this pension contribution, he will have a reduction in his income tax of £12,900. To get the full marks available, you would need to have explained how you arrived at that pension charge and also how the personal allowance amount was arrived at as that latter point specifically was mentioned in the requirement, which is why it is useful to either uh, do all of this in your word processing answer so that you can see it clearly or put something like that in bold so that you spot it because it's quite easy for people just to do the calculations and forget that there was a narrative part to it as well. And that really highlights the importance for you of making sure that you go back and read the requirement carefully a couple of times and certainly before you move on to the next task. Indeed the examiner noted that some students wasted time in the exam by calculating Pedro's income tax liability before he made the personal pension contribution when that information was already given to you in the question. Other students wrote a really detailed explanation of the rules instead of or as well as the computation but as I pointed out to you you were asked to explain all that you were actually really asked to explain was this personal allowance and how much of that was available and you know why that was so anything above that is really just a waste of efforts, even if it's technically correct. So make sure that you read the requirements and you only do what you have been asked to do. There are many more really useful exam tips in the examiner's report, so make sure you build a review of that into your study plan. I hope you found this session useful in helping you to prepare for your exam and I wish you the best of luck.